All right. Okay, film class. Hope you're doing well. So here, just a couple of pre-topic things that, that I want to mention in passing. So most of you have probably read my email from yesterday or my, my announcement through, through Converge from yesterday. Um, and I, I had some feedback on that. So if you haven't, you can go through and read it. Uh, some of it was just informative, but I did have to deal with the uh, pretty severe lack of, of uh, Zoom lecture viewing. So you should also know that I followed that up today with another email that was um, you know, intended to kind of encourage you guys a little bit. So please read that as well. There's some, some comments and questions that, that uh, assumed that I was thinking things about all of you that I certainly wasn't. So uh, you're my students. I care about you. I think we're good now, but uh, hopefully we're on the same page, even if it's for just the last couple of class periods. Moving forward, if we have online learning formats, things to keep in mind that lectures, whether they're synchronous or, a or asynchronous, as they are with this class, they are meant to serve as our class sessions. So just like I would expect all of you to be present for my class sessions where I'm going through material and trying to synthesize things for you, that's what these are intended to be. So uh, they're, not, they're not designed as optional. Maybe it's another way to put it. So hopefully we're on the same page now. I think that's probably true. Please go through and, and read both of those messages, not just the first one, but the follow-up. And uh, I think we'll, we'll be in a good place to finish the semester. Okay, so let's move on and, and keep digging into the rest of the 21st century. You guys have, um, most of you who had any, um, any outstanding film reviews, you've submitted those. So if for any reason you have forgotten one, please let me know and submit that as soon as possible. And then at this point, you guys need to start working on your your greatest director critiques, which are due next week. All of that's been, been outlined for you. I think you're, you're aware of the due dates and all that stuff. So please no pictures, please no you know, strange submissions. Send it to me as a Microsoft Word attachment or a PDF. Either one I can open with no problem, but don't get overly creative with other kinds of programs, but because I've had some issues with, with some submissions. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna go through and, and deal with a number of dramatic films today, a, a, few, a few in the romance film genre, as well as some uh, political thrillers and a few military or combat pictures as well. And then on Friday, we're gonna be talking about, for at least 15 minutes on Friday, I'm gonna talk about your, your two films that many of you I think are planning on doing the comparative review between Malik's film, A Hidden Life, and the preceding film that came out in 2016 by Scorsese called Silence. So I'm gonna spend a little time on those and then kind of wrap things together with some sci-fi films and with some old masters that are still around making great movies. Okay, uh, so some dramatic films. I wanna start with a couple of films that I posted. So this is another reminder, if you have been watching these, these Zoom lectures, my goal is that in the middle of these, we're, we're doing as much, um, you know, much, as much integration as we can. So I have continued to post a number of clips. So as I mentioned these clips, my, my suggestion is you pause the Zoom lecture, watch the clip, come back, and we can keep going. So there are a few that I posted for today, starting with one of the great films, really, of the past 20, 30 years. And it's a, it's a biopic dealing with uh, one of the, the great British monarchs of the 20th century, um, King Edward, whose, uh, whose real name was uh, typically to his family, typically known as Bertie. And this is during the 30s and, and 40s, World War II. And he had a pretty severe speech impediment. And this film details how he you know, he never completely overcame it. He learned how to contend with it and to do so very effectively. 
And uh, the film, Tom Hooper's film from 2010, The King's Speech, details you know, the, the speech therapist that he goes to see, their relationship, their friendship that, it, that ensues. Um, it is actually really well laid out as far as a historical set piece as well. So there's a lot of good historical context that comes into the mixture. And Colin Firth is just absolutely brilliant in the title role, in, in the key role. Not that, not that Jeffrey Rush is not very, very excellent in the film too. He's great as the speech therapist, you'll see that. But uh, boy, what a, what a fantastic performance from Colin Firth. And it, obviously it made a dent because he wins the Oscar for, for best actor as a result of this film and very highly, highly deserved, well-deserved response. So the film clip that I posted actually is one of the one of the ones I just enjoy. There are a lot of really interesting moments in the film, but one of the more lighthearted moments is when you see the Jeffrey Rush character, the speech therapist, walking the king through uh, through these different speech exercises. And you see him, you know, doing just outrageously silly looking things for a British monarch in the 1940s. So, you know, learning how to roll his tongue differently and and exercise his vocal cords and improve, uh, you know, improve his breath intake and all sorts of other things. So, and it, it's it's the scene where they're showing that, and I, I really love that scene. Just a a great example of how Tom Hooper integrates some levity into a lot of difficulty and and some pretty severe challenges that the king undergoes during the course of the film. So. Um, Really, really excellent movie. One of the great dramas, I think, of the past decade or two, maybe even more, and I would highly recommend it to you. Another one I'm gonna mention in passing, I'm not, I did not post clips of a couple of these, but I do want you to be aware of them. Uh, also in 2010, we have The, the Social Network, a David Fincher film that, that details the rise of what ultimately will become Facebook, right? The Facebook empire. <laughs> And so it, it details the very young entrepreneurial life of Mark Zuckerberg. And it, you know, Zuckerberg never has been a big fan of this film because it, it very much portrays him as a bit of a snake, uh, especially at the end of the film when he, he sells some of his friends and colleagues who helped him build his company and put it on the map. He, he sells them out and, and completely screws them over. And, and the film shows some of that, although not, not all of it. I mean, there's been more that's come to light in the past nine, 10 years that actually suggests that what is depicted in the film is pretty light. So, uh, but it's an excellent film and it is, it certainly has its dramatic flair and it, and it works very well. Another one I wanna mention in passing, it's technically a sports film in, in a number of ways, but it's, it's more of, of a, an engaging drama that covers uh, it's a film called Moneyball that covers uh, one of the one of the great uh, decisions of the past 25, 30 years in in baseball to utilize statistics more effectively. And if that sounds like it's a very cold and uninviting piece, I think you probably would be surprised if you gave it a shot. Brad Pitt plays the title role and does a really phenomenal job. Um, Lincoln the famous biopic on obviously Abraham Lincoln by Steven Spielberg with Daniel Day-Lewis in the title role playing the president is a beautiful piece of filmmaking. It is, um, it is everything you would expect it to be with a great director like that and with a, a wonderful actor in that kind of a lead role. Very historically, contextually well presented. They had to compress a few things here and there. So the timeline is a little bit adjusted in a part or two, but it is a very engaging film talking about particularly the, the push for the 13th Amendment as the Civil War is winding down. And man, just some really wonderful scenes. I would highly recommend that to you as well if you haven't seen it. Not a big surprise that Spielberg and Daniel Day-Lewis make a film that is actually just excellent and deserves a lot of attention. Uh, the other film is a David O. Russell film. So uh, David Russell has, has made a number of great films over the years. American Hustle comes out in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, and, and gets a, a fair amount of attention, but I think it was 
it was bypassed by some other films that year because it was such a particularly strong film year. So it's, it's a great film about the, uh, one of the great scams of the 1980s. And it, it, uh, one of the things I like about it is, as with all David O. Russell films, he does a great job of humanizing you know, some of these major events and making his characters very well-rounded. So I would highly recommend that to you. Uh, very, very great, very strong performances from really everyone in the film. I, I particularly loved Jeremy Renner in the film. I thought that his portrayal, his character was just so wonderful and, and he does a fine job of bringing him to the forefront very effectively. But the other film I wanna, the other couple films I wanna mention in passing, there are, there are actually two here. So uh, 12 Years a Slave is a, a film directed uh, by, not the, obviously the actor Steve McQueen, who is no longer with us, he died in 1980, but the, the black director, Steve McQueen. And McQueen, you know, had been making inroads with a number of indie films to this point and, and gets her, you know, actually got some really good notoriety, got a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of good attention from some film critics, and that garnered him some support in a couple of the different studios for some projects that he'd been working on to present to them. And he, he ends up getting the, the job to helm to direct 12 Years a Slave. And it's, it's the, the just heartrending story. And there's a true story and the depictions in here, again, there is some compression. There are some characters that are blends that are, uh, you know, concocted blends of multiple historical figures here and there. Uh, but, but the story is just, uh, you know, there are, no pull, there are no punches pulled in this story. And McQueen is very careful to deliver this, this portrayal of slavery in the deep South and the complete injustice that surrounds the life of Solomon Northup and bring that to the forefront in both you know, crushing ways that are just brutally difficult to watch, but also some some unbelievably inspirational ways. Um, title character Solomon Northup is played by brilliantly by uh, Juatella Giafor, who's one of the just wonderful actors working today. Uh, has been in a number of great films, actually, but this is the one that he's to this point in his career that he is probably best known for because he just knocks this role out of the park, and he's so so wonderful in it. And it tells a story of a of Northup who's a, a northerner living in the north, uh, who's an, an artist, a musician, and he is he is stolen and and forcibly brought south into you know the deep south into the system of the cotton economy and ends up living, as the title suggests, ends up living as a slave in captivity for more than a decade before he is finally located and brought back to the North and freed from that horrible circumstance. And it's through his experiences. There's a, a memoir that Northup wrote that, that survived and, and still is used in a lot of history courses. And, and there's good reason for that actually. Um, very difficult read, but also very meaningful one. And, and this film certainly portrays uh, his exposure to the realities of the slave system, the various taskmasters that he meets, the dehumanization that's part of the process. He, he interacts, he sees other slaves who are, who are living through the hell that he has now been exposed to himself. And, and it also, one of the brilliant things that McQueen does is he, he portrays the different, uh, you know, the different white owners and overseers in in different ways and I, I like that he humanizes this and differentiates and the goal is not to say well this guy who wasn't you know as much of a taskmaster and wasn't physically brutal he's just fine that's not what he's saying he's he's portraying the different levels of hardship that were bestowed upon these slaves and he's showing that not every southern slave owner thought the same about how they should treat their slaves. Some of them viewed the slaves as, as animals to be beaten. Others viewed them as valuable property, which is still dehumanizing and horrible, but it's a different approach. And, and man, it is, it is just a phenomenally well done film. So you have, 
you know, you have some, some just uh, outlandishly evil slave owners who are, who are not only um, engaging in the sin of slavery itself, in a broad sense, they are also just horrendous, nasty, mean, mean-spirited, vicious people on top of everything, and their slaves lives, live these lives of uh, even more intensified misery because of it. So there, there are depictions of that. Even so, the Michael Fassbender slave owner, his his um, derision toward, you know, obviously the the term in the film that is contextually oriented is, of course, the term nigger. It is thrown around quite a bit. This is a depiction of the South, after all, in the 1860s. And so the, the uh, Michael Fassbender character is one of those that's throwing that term around very consistently as he refers to these, uh, these pieces of property that he does not view to be any different than animals. You have the Benedict Cumberbatch character who is more benevolent, but still a slave owner. And you have a, a really great character, the Bass character, who's, uh, who's played by Brad Pitt who believes in uh, universal equality, and he is nothing like uh, really anyone that Solomon has met in the South during his time as a slave. And, and he, and the, the Brad Pitt character agrees to send word north regarding who Solomon actually is. He's been given a new name as a slave, uh, who he is, where he is, and where to come and find him. And it, it ends up being his deliverance. And the scene that I posted is at the very end of the film when when word has been sent and received up north and uh, friends of Solomon Northup come, come south to find him at this plantation and they take him away from, from this absolutely horrid circumstance through which he has lived for all these years. And it's, a, it's an explosive, emotional, and very, you know, obviously heartrending, but also relieving scene when you realize that, that Solomon Northup is going to actually survive the entire experience. Phenomenally well done film and rightly got an awful lot of attention. Um, I would highly recommend it to you. It is one of the great dramas of the early 21st century. Okay, another film that I, I could have put in the political thriller category that, uh, that has so much of a dramatic flair to it, I'm just, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about it now, is a film called Bridge of Spies which is another Spielberg film. And as much as I love Lincoln, and I do, I think it's a wonderful film, and, and I think that, um, that Daniel Tay Lewis is, as he always tends to be, I mean, we see him in so many different films where he, he just knocks it out of the park with his portrayals. I love him as Abraham Lincoln. Man, just unbelievable. But of the two films, I, I still, I really think that Bridge of Spies is superior in a number of ways. There's more... Uh, historical contextual framing done in the film. It deals with a highly, you know, an explosive time period in American history, maybe as much or more in some respects than that last, that last breath of the Civil War as, as the embers of the war begin to die away. And, and here we're dealing with the height of the Cold War in about 1960 or so. And uh, the, the framing here is a, it's a very complex story that tells of you know, in the Cold War scenario between the United States and the Soviet Union, it portrays this Soviet spy, Rudolf Abel, who is played by Mark Rylance in the film. Mark Rylance, a wonderful, wonderful actor. And I, I just love him in this role as Rudolf Abel, uh, who was caught for espionage and arrested by our government and goes on trial. And, and there's danger of execution. And and the Tom Hanks character, so Donovan is the lawyer that's brought in to represent Abel. And the goal all along by many was to just give him, you know, give Abel his constitutionally required, you know, legal representation. But the goal was, you know, to just have their bases covered, really. Uh, there was the hope that, you know, the book would be thrown at, at, uh, at Rudolph Abel and that he would never, never again see the outside of a jail, scale, a jail cell, or he might even be executed. All through this lens of communism and communist infiltration of our country during the Cold War. 
And this is also cast against another character midway through the film. We see Francis Gary Powers, who is a U-2 spy plane pilot shot down over Russia in 1960. And his ordeal is also portrayed and it sets up one of the more brilliant aspects of the film in which Donovan goes to the attorney played by Tom Hanks, Donovan goes to Europe to try to secure a trade for Abel going back to the Soviet Union and Francis Gary Powers being returned to the United States. And it's just, it's a very complex narrative actually to tie all these pieces together and to keep it flowing in one consistent direction. And yet, because it's Steven Spielberg, it is done beautifully and well. Um, both Mark Rylance and Tom Hanks are phenomenal in the movie. And the, the clip that I posted is just one of the, the very best, uh, as far as a dramatic set piece, one of the great moments. Spielberg understands how to weave these highly, um, these humanizing moments into even his most complex films, even his action adventure pieces. He does this very well. And in this film, there's a great moment where Donovan is standing in the cell uh, with Abel and Abel tells him a story. Uh, he, he, he's trying to tell Donovan, in essence, how he appreciates the efforts that have been made on his behalf from a legal perspective. And, and he knows that Donovan has been under intense pressure, and indeed he was, and many in his own culture, many in his own government, many in his own law firm were very, very upset by how hard Donovan was fighting for constitutional rights to be paid to this arrested Soviet espionage agent. agent. And in this, this great scene, um, Abel tells Donovan a story of, of a man in his past that Donovan reminds him of. And it's the, it's the famous standing man sequence in the film. And I want you to watch that. I think it just, it brings so much together in the film of, of the power of these two characters and of that moment in American history. It's just a, a really great film, not surprisingly, not, not surprisingly by one of the great filmmakers of all time, Steven Spielberg. Okay. Um, I think for those dramas, that is what I have posted. That's what I'm looking at here. That's what I did. So let me move forward. Um, so a couple of, of romance films that, that I wanted to mention in passing that I, I think really do deserve some of our attention. And, oh, you know what? There is another one. I forgot. So let me just punch back here. So another film by a one of the, the great young British filmmakers named Joe Wright. So Joe Wright really sprang onto the scene in 2005 with his, his wonderful vision of Pride and Prejudice starring Kira Knightley in the title role as Elizabeth Bennett. Wonderful film. And, and he goes on, there's another great film, Atonement, uh, that's well done, a, a film, it's more of a Sci not a sci-fi, it's more of an action adventure film called Hannah. But in, in 2017, Wright makes a film about not the battle, not the military, it doesn't hone in on the military aspect of Dunkirk. It is a moment in Britain's history here in 1940 that is framed through the lens of British politics and society at the time. And it's, it's a film called Darkest Hour. And Gary Oldman plays the title role, Winston Churchill role in the film. And with Joe Wright's, you know, really expert direction, bringing, excuse me, a lot of cultural context into the mixture, but also with Oldman's portrayal of Winston Churchill. This is one of those films, if you have not seen it, you really need to make time for it. And it brings together a lot of great historical context, but it does so in engaging, really magnetic ways. And it's a reminder for, especially for those who are not familiar with American history or global history for that matter, I should say, those who are not familiar with history period, how, how important it is for, to remember that these, these critical moments in human history didn't have to play out as they did, and they could have gone very and dramatically differently. And, and this is one of those 
key moments, and it happens to be taking place during probably the most famous cataclysm of the 20th century, and that's World War II. But, you know, it's important to realize how serious that moment really was when, when in 1940, the spring of 1940, so this is May, May of 1940, uh, Britain stands alone against the Nazi menace that is sweeping across Western Europe. Britain, uh, uh, France has fallen. Uh, the, the British forces at Dunkirk are in serious danger of being eliminated. The, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers, uh, both mostly British, but also French, they've been pushed to the brink. It, there is a lot of danger here. And, and what happens in that moment you know, could seal the fate of the British Empire, of the British people, because Germany is preparing for an invasion of the British home island. And there are many in the British Parliament who are actually, they've, they've already raised the white flag. They're ready to throw in the towel and to say, you know what, let's, let's see if we can get good, good terms from Hitler and move in that direction. The, the war is over, no need to fight. We're, you know, we're just going to give in. We're going to, to see if we can get a good deal. And there were a lot of them in the British Parliament, and many in Britain, many civilians in Britain weren't really sure what was going to happen or where they should be, you know, where they should stand. And, and this film portrays uh, the power of certain personalities, not the least of which, of course, was, was Winston Churchill. And Churchill was one of the members of Parliament who, of course, rises to to prime minister at this crucial moment in history. And Churchill was, was clear from the very beginning that, that uh, he and his government were gonna advise fighting the German advance. And, and that the, the appeasement policy was a dead policy, was a costly destructive policy. And that a fight for very civilization was at stake. And, and man, it is, it's a powerful film that it, it brings uh, British politics of the 1940s, of that year, of 1940, it brings it to this, uh, you know, this engaging roar. You're, you're just, you're absorbed into the conversations and into the reality as you watch this unfold and are reminded of how, of how important this moment is. And when you see Gary Oldman as Churchill, you're just going to be, you're just going to be blown away. Uh, it's one of the absolute great performances of all time. In a, in a film role. So uh, another drama I wanted, wanted you to be aware of, please watch that clip. And if you have not seen the film, put it on your watch list for some time in the near future. Okay, so going back to some, some romantic films uh, of the, the last few years. And the one I wanna start with is La La Land. So this is a Damien Chazelle film from a couple years back from 2016 um, with uh, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling in the, in the two key roles. And it's really one, one of the things that all audiences love about the film is that it's so delightful. It's impossible not to, to leave the theater or leave, in this case now, you know, leave your, your couch, right? It's, it's impossible uh, to, you know, to finish that film without a big smile on your face. It reminds me in, in many respects, it reminds me an awful lot of Singing in the Rain. Just a delightful story, delightful characterizations, a lot of wonderful choreography, really great music, and just you know, really a lot of very fine performances. If you're not aware of how, how, um, how skilled both Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling were when it comes to singing and dancing. Well, you can watch this film and see it. Just a uh, reminder, I, I always forget this, but Ryan Gosling used to be uh, when he was a little guy, not, probably about 10, 12 years old, I guess. When he was about 12, 12, 13 years old, Ryan Gosling was on the old Mickey Mouse show or, or on the Mickey Mouse show in the 1990s. And um, that's kind of how he got his start, how he was noticed. He actually spent some time at, at that same moment in his life. Uh, one of the other cast members was a very young Britney Spears, of all things. So, yeah, you watch, I, you watch La La Land and, and you quickly realize, oh my goodness, yeah, this is, um, 
this is kind of a shocker seeing Ryan Gosling in a role like that, but he's, he's excellent in it. Emma Stone is absolutely stunning in her role as well. It's a delightful film. And I think it's more, uh, one of the reasons it's, it absorbs so many audiences is because uh, it is sort of a throwback. It, it is very reminiscent of a musical, a romantic musical from the 1950s or something along those lines. And, and audiences just loved it. It's also, by the way, just visually stunning. The choreography is excellent. And the songs are very catchy. And, you know, the supporting cast members were also wonderful in the film. A lot of a lot of sequences. There's a great scene with a whole line of cars on a highway that I did not post that I absolutely love in the film, as, as many did who watched it. And it is it's just a delight. And and yet the romantic qualities of the film are certainly brought to the forefront with these characters. So that is one of the clips that I posted for you, and I think you would really enjoy watching that film. Uh, it's, it's a great film for, you know, uh, for a romantic date kind of a thing. Just wonderful, wonderful movie. Okay, uh, let me see here. So I've got to move on or make sure I'm, I'm sticking with my, my film list of clips that I posted. I think that's, I think that's where I need to be. All right, yes. So we're gonna move on here and deal with some, some action suspense films. And really what I'm gonna deal with here briefly is, uh, is some political thriller films that I think deserve mentioning. So as I said a minute ago, I, I think that it's fair to say that Bridge of Spies technically could be thrown into the mixture here, but uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of others and, and uh, kind of go from there. So by the way, on Friday, I know I mentioned that we're going to do some comparative review stuff for the, the Malik and and Scorsese films, but I'm also going to come back and deal with a few of the, uh, you know, the, the veteran directors, some of their great films from the 2010s, as well as some some more up and comers. So that's how we're going to end the semester on Friday. Okay, um, let me see. Oh, I wanted to start with Zero Dark Thirty. When it comes to the political thriller films of the 2010s, I think it's one of the very best, and. Uh, it is, it documents, it's by Catherine Bigelow, um, just a wonderful filmmaker. She's, she and Sofia Coppola, in, in my opinion, kind of had the list of, of uh, women filmmakers in the 21st century so far. Uh, there are some, there are a few others that do some excellent work, but, but time and again, um, Catherine Bigelow and, and Sofia Coppola just are, are pumping out exceedingly high quality work. And, and that is definitely the case with this Bigelow film, Zero Dark Thirty, which, which documents the hunt for Osama bin Laden in the aftermath of 9-11. And the title role of Maya, so the, the key individual in Maya is actually a composite character. There were at least, uh, there were at least three CIA um, personnel who, who kind of rolled into that character, although there's there's one woman in particular that she most epitomizes. So the Maya role is fictitious technically, but there, there were some uh, CIA personnel that actually were involved in these ops. And Maya is played by Jessica Chastain in one of her great roles. She's such a wonderful actress. And you know, I, if my, my first exposure to Jessica Chastain was in a, a Terrence Malick film called Tree of Life, and she's she plays the the mother in that film, and she's just wonderful in that movie. And and then I saw this film and I thought, man, this this actress is just you know on this this ascension. She's going to be a a major force in English language film for years and years to come, and I think that will be true. She's wonderful in this movie. There's a, a very you know, very solid supporting cast. I'm not going to go through all the different actors in the film, but she headlines this this particular movie. She is assigned uh, the unenviable task uh, to 
to put together a task force, a CIA task force that begins to hunt down connections who can figure out where Osama bin Laden is hiding and where he continues to, to pull the reins on the Al-Qaeda, the remnants of the Al-Qaeda organization. And, you know, there, there were suspicions that there may have been some more jobs that he was planning and that subsidiaries of Al-Qaeda were, were preparing to undertake some more terrorist actions. So this is all, you know, this is all brought into the forefront of the story. Now, the, the genius of this film is that it's taking some highly complex geopolitical realities and it's, again, creating human drama and, and weaving together a cohesive plot line that allows the viewer to follow it well, uh, bringing together you know, the, the dramatic realities faced by the CIA operatives, many of the people, many of the snitches that they were relying on for information, uh, just reminding the audience of the trauma of 9-11 and the aftermath with the global war on terror. All of this is just brought to the forefront exceedingly well. It is outlandish to me even now that at the time the certain members of, of the Western film critic community and many members of Hollywood were so critical of the film because there were sequences that showed this, the CIA's willingness to utilize torture methods to get information. So the, you know, some captured terrorist personnel um, were tortured and it, there are a couple of sequences that reveal that. And the charge was that Catherine Bigelow was, was somehow um, presenting this as an affirmation that that kind of behavior was fine and that nothing could be further from the truth. It was a stark revelation that, you know, in maybe in some respects that the, the United States government, that the CIA made some, some very dangerous and unethical decisions in the sense that uh, we were willing to pursue a, uh, a very meaningful end by undertaking horribly questionable means to achieve that, that ethical goal. And so, you know, the question of, well, how, you know, the means to achieve an end, you, you can't compromise yourself in that way. And, and even the Jessica Chastain character, so Maya is very uncomfortable with, with some of these actions and she, she tells her superiors so. So I, I, I think a lot of the charges about, you know, torture in the film are uh, very weak-minded, and obviously I don't even, I, I sometimes wonder if they were actually able to watch through the entire film and they knew what they were talking about. But uh, this thoroughly excellent film, which was initially in line, I think, for some serious best, best picture Oscar contention, was just, you know, taken out of the mixture as soon as, as a lot of these naysayers uh, decided to make these judgment calls, which I think is pretty asinine. The, the sequence where the, the bin Laden compound is ultimately located and then there is the, the assault by uh, U.S. Navy SEALs on the compound, all of this is happening at night. That entire sequence is, is like a, a filmmaker's course in suspense choreography. And, um, you know, there have been a number of, of film critics and film professors who commented on this. And uh, if you watch that sequence, it is just so perfectly brought together. It's, it's keeping the audience on the edge of their seats, but they know exactly what's going on. It's, it's really, really well done. The sequence I posted, I think just highlights the, the wonderful characterization and portrayal of Maya by Jessica Chastain. And she comes in and she's they're in an airplane hangar with a bunch of, she, she and her, a couple of her CIA colleagues are in an airplane hangar with a bunch of, of these, you know, type A personality U.S. Navy SEALs, and you know they're they're li listening to a briefing, and she's called in to to tell them what she expects of them, and and uh, it's one of the great sequences in the film, and she she almost instantly wins over the respect of these these Navy SEALs. She's obviously uh, really tough, and doesn't take any crap from anybody, and and she's just you know, that that. That moment is a great revelation of Maya's character and what she's what she expects of herself, but also what she expects of others. Um, really, really good sequence. Okay, another film. 
from the 21st century that from the 2010s, I should say, that is a wonderful geopolitical thriller. And, you know, I'm not sure if it deserved to win Best Picture or not from 2012. Um, but it certainly should have been one of the contenders and it ultimately wins wins Best Picture. Argo is the name of the film and directed by Ben Affleck. And uh, I still think one of his earlier films called The Town uh, is, is maybe his best directing effort to date in his career. But this one is not far behind and it's really just so thoroughly well done. It is not a perfect film, but it is, it's pretty close. It, it is a very beautifully framed, the pacing is just perfect. The intensity is building. There are, there are perfect moments of levity, some lighthearted comedic moments. They do not last long, but they're interspersed throughout the film so that the audience can catch their breath and have a good chuckle at the outlandish construct that this film is revolving around. It deals with the seizure of the US embassy compound by uh, Iranian college students, really most of them, Iranian rebels who, are, who were inspired by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, this is the Iran hostage crisis being framed uh, for, for its global context, but then the human story of, of some of the members who escaped, who hide out in the Canadian embassy, uh, the, the Canadian embassy leader's house for a while, and await uh, the opportunity to be smuggled out of the country. And, and the outlandish plan in the film that's, that's portrayed, um, and some of this has been declassified by the way, so it's really an interesting story. So Ben Affleck not only directs the film, he's, he's playing this role, uh, Tony in the film, and he's, he's a CIA operative who's an exfiltrator. So he is sent in to try to get people out of these highly volatile situations to, to sometimes just sneak them out. And, and he does this, the, the decision is made to construct a, a fake movie, a fake science fiction movie called Argo, and to use that as the, uh, essentially the set piece to fly into Iran and to convince the Iranian officials that this film crew um, headed by, by the CIA operative, this Ben Affleck CIA operative, that that this this guy and his film crew are are just kind of casing the area, looking for good, you know, places to film this sci-fi piece, and and then to to make them to you know to to get them IDs that are convincing. He's going to take those IDs, let these let these Americans who are who are now living with this this uh, Canadian diplomat. They're, they're all gonna take on these, these uh, film crew roles and this will be their cover and this will ostensibly get them out of Iran in this horrible moment. And the clip that I posted is probably the most uh, humorous in the film. So it's, it's not a film that's a, a humorous movie, but I, I love the sequence where they go before the, <laughs> the, the two heads of the CIA, their, the, their ops and their intelligence directors and um, they they try to pass off this plan well they they, they pass off this plan and the, the response is this is the best bad idea you know this is the best you know the idea you have and, and the response is yes sir this is the best bad idea we could come up with <laughs> and it's it's just a perfect moment in the film I would highly recommend it to you if you haven't seen it it is it brings together a lot of the complexity of the geopolitics, but it does so in a very entertaining way. Okay, um, let's see. I want to, I think, just looking through my sheet here, I don't wanna unnecessarily leave something out. Okay, yes, moving on. A Couple of, of war films. So the last two things I'm gonna mention, at least for today, at least the last ones for today, because uh, we're not going to end the sci-fi quite yet. So the last ones for today are are going to be 
couple of, of great war films from the 2010s. And the first of these is 2014's American Sniper by Clint Eastwood. So Eastwood, great director, a lot of wonderful films. And I'll, I might mention him briefly on Friday. We'll see if I have another chance. I loved his, his uh, dual films, Flags of Our Fathers, and especially Letters from Iwo Jima about World War II. I think Letters from Iwo Jima may in fact be uh, the best war film of the 21st century so far. I, it's just profoundly, um, you know, profoundly influential and also just a beautiful film in many respects, even though it deals with such a horrid story, a horrid narrative. Uh, but American Sniper was kind of one of the big surprises of 2014, and it details the, the career, the life and career of Chris Kyle, who was a Navy SEAL sniper serving in the Iraq War and back in the early part of the century. And, and despite, again, despite critics who, who claimed it was kind of a jingoistic war picture, uh, which it certainly was not, Clint Eastwood was, again, as he tends to do, he, he pulls no punches. He wanted, he wanted the audience to see the costs of war for the soldiers, for the enemy soldiers, for their families back home, the impact it makes on their lives, what those sacrifices look like. And Chris Kyle's story is certainly one that is full of, of sacrifice. It is a it's a very dramatic story. It's a very tragic story at the end of the day. Um, but it's also very moving in, in a number of different ways. As you see Kyle, his wife back home, as she's you know, going through the trauma of being separated from her husband while he's in a combat zone. You see the realities of modern combat and how they prey upon Chris Kyle, and he, he is deeply affected emotionally and psychologically from his combat experiences in Iraq. And, and also, just uh, very uniquely, the, the psychological trauma uh, that, that tends to impact snipers in particular although that isn't really developed as much in the film, that is at least alluded to. And um, really a very, very well staged and well executed film. The, the clip I posted is, is actually a, a portrayal of one of the most famous moments in modern American military history, and that is Chris Kyle's accidental, in a sense, accidental zeroing. He, he actually locates an enemy sniper who has been uh, preying upon American soldiers for months and months and months, um, and and this this is a a famous moment in the Iraq War and in the annals of American combat. Uh, Chris Kyle makes a an outrageous shot from nearly two thousand meters away and is able to target and eliminate this enemy sniper who was. He was killing American soldiers. It's one of the most famous sniper shots of the 21st century, and that's portrayed in this film, and that's the clip that I put on there. Excellent film. There's, there's a fair amount of trauma in it, um, psychological, physical trauma that is portrayed in it. Uh, Chris Kyle's story ends tragically. I'm not going to give all of that away, but don't, I, I don't want you to be too shocked by that. Um, not by his own hand, but uh, you know, by a returning veteran who kind of lost his mind a little bit. So very, very, very well done film. The other one I want to mention in passing is Lone Survivor, um, actually starring Mark Wahlberg in, in one of the key roles, portrays a, a Navy SEAL team that is, that is sent uh, to do some recon, and they're ultimately, um, <laughs> they're, they're ultimately forced to engage hundreds and hundreds of enemy soldiers in this mountainous region, and that, that story is portrayed there. It is a very well done film. But the film that I, the other film I posted is, I think, one of the most difficult war films I personally watched in quite a while because it is, it is intensely graphic. It's called Hacksaw Ridge, and it portrays, you know, these, uh, the American assaults on, on a couple of Japanese islands, really, but, but particularly uh, this, this soldier story, Desmond Doss, who was, uh, who did, who was willing to fight. 
he was well he was willing to go to war but he refused uh, because of his beliefs he refused to to be a combatant he refused to to carry a rifle and to shoot and kill soldiers he wanted to be a uh, battlefield medic and ultimately his desire was granted but he he goes through a lot of trauma just being accepted into that role and earning any respect from his fellow soldiers who are also called into combat, of course. And it's the story of how this all plays out uh, as, as Doss goes into combat. He's a, by the way, he's a, a devout Christian uh, and kept a really interesting prayer journal along with his Bible. And that part of the story is, is told as well. So this is a, a film directed by Mel Gibson and, and it's directed thoroughly and well. A lot of really uh, poignant touches in the film that, that allow the audience, I think, very meaningfully to connect with Doss and to, you know, and to hope for his survival. But, but also it, it reveals how careless we human beings sometimes are with our assumptions because many of his fellow soldiers and his commanding officers are very dismissive of Doss and think that he is a, a coward and that he really does not want to fight for his country and that he doesn't care and all the other things that might go along with it. Nothing could be further from the truth, but they don't find that until they're all in combat together. And, and this man is their, is their angel on the battlefield. And, and that part of the story is finally told. It is told in brutal fashion because the combat scenes in this film are just, um, yeah, I, they're, they're just horribly difficult to watch. In fact, I, I typically have to zip forward through a few of them because it's just pretty, pretty nasty and overwhelming. And, um, you know, Saving Private Ryan, equally tough in some ways, but I think this one even, even is more tough to watch. Still, it's, it's a really well done contextual piece of filmmaking. And uh, war films are not easy to make and make meaningfully and to do so contextually. And yet both, both of these films certainly do that, both the Clint Eastwood film and the Mel Gibson film. So I would highly recommend them both to you. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. So on Friday, I'm gonna be finishing the semester, walking through a few more films, again, some veteran filmmakers, a couple of newer filmmakers, and we're, we are gonna spend a little time talking about uh, the comparative review films that I hope many of you will will actually take, a, take the time to watch and review. I'm looking forward to at least a few of those, those extra credit reviews from you guys. So I think that's it for the, for the time being though. So for today, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off, but I will be connecting with you guys vis-a-vis -vis the Zoom lecture on Friday the 24th, and that'll, that'll be the way that we wrap up the semester. Alrighty then, have a good evening.